Very good afternoon. I'm Aisha and I'll be your host for today's webinar. Kindly note that this webinar will be recorded. It is my pleasure to welcome you to our Actually Cell Therapy Lecture Series. Today's lecture by our distinguished speaker, Associate Prof Lim Chui Ming, focuses on natural killer cell therapeutics in nasopharyngeal cancer. Prof Lim graduated from NUS and underwent residency in otolaryngology. He pursued head and neck surgery and was awarded the MOH Overseas Training Award to undergo head and neck oncology fellowship at the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center in the USA. He is a, he's presently a senior consultant, head and neck surgeon at SGH. He serves as the HOD of Clinical Translational Research in SGH. He is also an adjunct clinician scientist at the Institute of Bioengineering and Bioimaging and an Associate Prof at the Duke NES Medical School. Thanks so much for the introduction. Uh, I'm sharing my screen now and I hope you guys can see um, the screen. I said you can see the screen quite clearly. Yes, I can see you. Perfect. Yes. Yep. All right. Sorry. Uh, yeah. Thanks so much for the kind introduction. I'm Tri Ming Lim. I'm from uh, Singapore General Hospital. It's a pleasure to be here uh, speaking to a, a panel on the uh, cell therapy. Uh, my focus is on this cancer called nasopharyngeal cancer, and particularly I'm looking at using natural killer cells uh, against this uh, endemic cancer locally. I do not have any relevant disclosure for this presentation. Well, the, the, uh, I've broken down this presentation into three core, three core components. One is uh, just understanding the landscape of natural killer cells in the human microenvironment of MPC. And second, I would like to share a published trial with my, my previous mentor, Professor Dario Campana, on uh, treating refractory MPC patients. And finally, talking about the use of the off-the-shelf allogenic NK cells and how that, that uh, cell therapy product can be integrated into the uh, standard of care treatment for locally advanced cancer in order to minimize uh, distant relapse in the future. So just to give a brief overview of this cancer, it is uh, uniquely present in uh, Southern China, a Southeast Asia. As you can see on the world map, the areas that are uh, particularly uh, dark blue are the areas of high, uh, uh, high prevalence of these cancers. And this cancer is unique because it's associated with the Epstein-Barr virus or the EBV for short. And many studies and published works have shown that the type 2 latency of this particular EBV infection with the expression of LMP1, LMP2A and EPNA1 are associated with these cancers. And what is also important to note that this cancer is heavily infiltrated with lymphocytes, uh, making a attractive target for immunotherapy. Just to give a background on this cancer, this is a picture showing the endoscopic view for ENT surgeons uh, who are uh, usually uh, called in to diagnose this cancer. The standard of care or treatment, depending on the stage, primarily is radi uh, radiotherapy and with uh, concurrent chemo radiotherapy in uh, locally advanced cases, they are non-metastatic in nature. When you look under the microscope, certainly this on the left side, you can see this pyomorphic um, tumor cells. And when we stain this uh, tumors using the app, uh, EBA, which is a marker for EBV, you can see that it is quite ubiquitously uh, associated with this EBV virus. Uh, as I've alluded earlier, this cancer is particularly heavily infiltrated with lymphocytes, as you can see on the circles. They're just infiltrating around the tumor and within the tumor, and many groups have been very particularly interested to see what are the composition of the lymphocytes and what do they really impact in the biology of these cancers. So likewise, our group look at this by just staining CE3 positive as a marker for all the lymphocytes. As you can see, patients with a predominantly heavily infiltrated CD3 positive have a much superior uh, survival at two years, and that is compatible with other published uh, uh, reports from other centers. And we began to look at how about dissecting the different composition of the lymphocytes. And we look at uh, natural killer cells, and this we use a CD56 marker to stain for these cancers. And we did a panel of 50 uh, patients uh, on IHC to look at the this expression of NK cells among MPCs. And certainly you can see for the first patient, there are hardly any uh, NK cells infiltrating this tumor. 
And on second, on the, another patient, however, you can see there is a more densely infiltrated NK cells into the tumor microenvironment or NPCs. So when we group these 50 odd patients into the uh, percentages of the expression on IHC, and certainly you can see in figure B, there is a diverse uh, separation of NK high population versus the NK low population which is quite different from a CD8 positive. You can see it, it assumes a more normal distribution uh, in, in, in the CD8 positive T cells. And what was not noteworthy is when we compared the survival at two years among the NK high versus low population, we were paradoxically surprised to find that those patients with NK high, however, has a slightly poorer but statistically significant two-year overall survival. So that led us to look at some of the possible co-stimulatory markers uh, in the tumor microenvironment. So we use a, a panel of uh, um, IHC uh, no, flow cytometry actually to look at the, the, some of the co-expression uh, markers on NK cells. And certainly the PD-1 expressing NK cells certainly are more enriched among MPC tissues than in healthy nasopharyngeal tissues. So we began to ask the question whether these PD-1 expressing NK cells were significantly more, more present among the NK high group. And this was done on in vitro assay for a separate cohort of 10 patients where we isolated the NK cells from the tumor and then look at the co-expression of PD-1. And certainly you can find that on the bar graph that there is a higher proportion of the NK high uh, populations uh, expressing co-expressing the PD-1 molecule on this NK cells. And next, we want to look at a panel, uh, the, the cytokine profile among MPCs versus healthy na nasopharyngeal tissues. And we look at the literature and one of the, some of the key targets uh, we're alluding to is IL-18. And when we compare the expression of IL-18 among MPCs, certainly we find that there is a higher uh, relative fold change with much significantly enriched of IL-18 among MPC than healthy tissues. And next, we did a series of in vitro assays where we isolated, uh, uh, we, we isolated the NK cells from the blood and see what is the effect of IL-18 on the NK cells. And true and behold, we find that IL-18 alone was a responsible cytokine to, to um, cause the NK cells to, co -ex to express PD-1 molecule. And independent of IL-2, which is a common uh, cytokine that we use to expand our natural killer cells. So next, we look at the saturation kinetics and plotting it of the uh, increasing concentration of IL-18. We see that the saturation of the PD-1 on the NK cell reached a saturation point uh, in, in, in the co-cultures. So our pro proposed mechanism is that when NK cells are infiltrated into the MPCs, certainly the IL-18 does have a possible role where it causes the co-expression of PD-1 on this NK cell, rendering it uh, uh, energic. And therefore, that may account uh, to part of the story of how the NK high group of patients have a paradoxically poor survival in nasopharyngeal cancers. And this work has been published. Certainly, you can look at the, uh, the full manuscript for, for more information. But certainly, what, what is uh, gleaned from this study is to show that there is immense information that could be derived from the tumor microenvironment. And that gives us opportunities to modulate the tumor microenvironment in order to enhance anti-tumor effects uh, as cancer immunotherapy. So this is a, a graph that most may be familiar with. This is a cartoon taken from Robert Stryber where he talks about the cancer immunoadditing. The three E's either el elimination, equilibrium, or escape. I'll uh, primarily focus the, 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 the strategy that we use for NK cells in eliminating of cancers, either using the adaptive and innate uh, mechanism. This is a review that we published some years back where we look at how NK cells may be used to leverage against MPCs, either through ADCC by engaging uh, um, the FC receptor of the NK cell, uh, through an antibody to a surface expression on MPC. And certainly we know that um, the NK cells also crosstalk with the uh, dendritic cells, uh, and that can be cross-presentation of peptides that can be used to enhance downstream adaptive uh, CDL, uh, CD8 positive cytotoxic T cell therapy. 
So let's just give an overall how uh, on the uh, cartoon, how we can leverage on the innate immunity by enhancing uh, that killing so that we can further down uh, escalate the adaptive anti-tumor responses. So I'm going to give credit to my previous mentor in NUS, Professor Daru Kampana, who has pioneered this NK expansion protocol using K562 genetically modified with a membrane, mem membrane bound IL-15 with CD137 and certainly using this, uh, this strategy that has been patented, they will be able to expand a very robust activated NK cells for therapy. And this to that, uh, they have moved on to hematological cancers and moving to solid cancers, which I'm thankful to be part of the group looking at uh, EGFR positive hair and neck cancers. So this was the uh, uh, NK cell expansion for hair and neck protocol, where we investigate the, the lead uh, phase one lead on to a phase two design where we included at recurrent MPCs that are not surgically salvageable, that then patients who have failed at least two lines of palliative chemotherapy. This have to be the undifferentiated EBV positive. And at the same time, uh, we, we stipulate that the patient needs to demonstrate EGFR positive of more than 70% on the IHC. And certainly they must have measurable disease that can be used to track for responses and gener generally a good performance status and with reasonable life expectancy. So this is how the trial was registered uh, with the clinical trial uh, 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 website. At the same time, it was also approved by the local HSA authorities. So how we have positioned this NK cell is to leverage on ADCC or antibody dependent cellular cytotoxicities. So we use cetoximab, which is an anti-EGFR antibody as a pre preface where we actually treated the patient with four to six cycles of cetoximab. And the, the role of this uh, is to demonstrate there's no severe toxicity with cetoximab primarily. And at the same time, we wish to, we, we, we are using the mechanism whereby the cetoximab will be bound to the MPC targets. And when we give the NK cell, which is enriched the CD16, uh, after the expansion will then be used to tag, to, uh, will be trafficked trafficked to the MPC uh, coated with the, with the antibody and resulting in ADCC. So this was how the, the trial was designed and this was uh, given uh, two cycles of NK cells uh, with uh, concurrent uh, IL-2 to sustain the in, in vivo uh, expansion of these NK cells. So just to allude it, this is the strategy. We hope to engage the NK cell uh, using ADCCs by targeting the EGF-FR expression that is particularly a uh, high expression in MPC tumors. And certainly we are concerned about toxicities. Therefore, it was a, a slowly uh, phase one study before, before proceeding to subsequent phase of the uh, clinical trial. And this is just to show the cartoon illustrating certain uh, downstream uh, stimulation of the tumor-specific T-cell expansion through the NK dendritic cell crosstalk. So the phase one was primarily looking at feasibility and safety, and certainly we want to uh, move on to a phase two measuring tumor size and volume. And we do have correlative tumor uh, immune markers that allow us to understand how this NK cell would, would fare in this among the responders and non-responders. So in, in the first seven patients that were accrued, you can see that a large majority, all these patients are heavily pre-treated MPC patients, either with widely metastatic diseases or with locally regional advanced disease that has received prior irradiation and is not surgically salvageable. And this is just to demonstrate uh, the table showing some of the uh, demographics of this group of patients. I'd like to bring forth to this particular responder in our cohort. As you can see, uh, he has complete ophthalmoplegia and blindness on the left eye because of orbital invasion from the MPCs uh, shown on the CT scan on the left. And uh, what was noteworthy was in, in this study was that when we give, we found that patients who had received two cycles of NK cell inf uh, uh, infusion certainly did better in terms of a longer time before disease progression. And for our particular respondent illustrated earlier, you can see that after the first NK infusion, there was a, a clinically obvious, uh, observable improvement of the ptosis due to the involvement of the cranial nerve tree. And um, certainly you can see that there, there is improvement uh, uh, following the NK infusion. And the correlative imaging studies 
uh, although it did not meet any rhesus criteria for clinical response but you can see uh, after the first and then followed with the second uh, CT scan after the second infusion, there were more radiolucency within the orbital component of the tumor, uh, indicating there may be likely necrosis from the infusion of NK cells. Next, when we plot the percentage of NK cells during the, the treatment uh, in, the, in the circulation of this group of patients, that particular patient of the NK cells, uh, uh, even up to 25, up as long as 20, 23 weeks after treatment, uh, even after the NK, second NK cell infusion. And when we immunophenotype the NK cell, certainly we found the activated CD57 as well as the CD16 positive NK cells were particularly the phenotype that is circulating in this particular responder to this study. So this Although it's a phase one, but certainly it shows that uh, robust expansion of NK cells from an allogenic uh, autologous perspective can be achieved with, even with previous, previously he heavily pretreated MPC patients. And we've managed to achieve our maximum uh, safety dose of 1 to 10 to the power of 7 cells per kilogram in this study. And using the mechanism of ADCC, we managed to show an objective response of nearly 15%. All right, switching gears to recurrent MPCs, just to give an idea from the clinical perspective, the recurrent MPCs occurs about 10 to 15%. Whenever possible, sur surgeons like myself is, uh, can be called in to do surgical resection. Unfortunately, it is only limited to very uh, small recurrences, such as recurrent T1 and T2 disease and very small T3 diseases. And this is just to uh, illustrate uh, a small recurrent that is potentially amenable from surgical salvage. And this is how it looks like after surgical salvage, where uh, you can appreciate because of the tight confines of the nasal pharynx, it is technically a challenging procedure because you are exposing very critical structures like the C1, the internal carotid artery, and the clivus of the skull base. And this, this defect certainly need to be resurfaced uh, with a free flap reconstruction. All right, how about neck recurrences? Mostly we need to do a bodified radical or what we call a comprehensive neck dissection because of the high incidence of extracapsular spread. And sometimes we, we deal with patients with very isolated retropharyngeal lymph node, which is also not very clinically accessible by surgeons. Uh, however, a large, unfortunately, a large majority of patients are not resectable because when they, re they recur, like in, in these areas where they recur with intracranial involvement, uh, encroaching on the carotid artery or the cranial nerves, they are no longer surgical candidates. And this is another patient showing a biopsy-proven MPC with skull base involvement. Certainly, sometimes MPC recurred with very atypical sites such as a frontal sinus, but this is very, very bizarre disease that is known to recur very unusual sites after definitive treatment. Right, so the question that we have uh, to address this clinical need is that we know that among high risk, meaning stage three and four patients treated with definitive chemo radiotherapy, there is a very high uh, risk of recurrence among this group of patients. And that was what we have uh, sought to answer whether we could leverage on existing uh, immunotherapy strategies that could potentially reduce this risk of recurrence, which is reported as high as 30%. And the hypothesis that we have is that we could potentially intensify treatment with natural killer cell in an allogenic fashion to the standard conventional uh, standard of care for treating stage 3 and 4 by eliminating EBV DNA from the current 30% to 0%. As you um, just to give a, a brief introduction of EBV DNA, this is a highly sensitive assay that is currently integrated in the treatment of MPC patients so that clinicians can monitor the progress uh, not just by imaging endoscopy, but also by liquid biopsies. And the patient, if we, we know that, do not have a complete elimination of the circulating plasma EBV DNA uh, at a higher risk of distant relapses or, or recurrence in the future. So our cartoon shows how we plan that from a mechanism standpoint, how we could integrate NK cells in this setting. Because after during concurrent uh, chemo radiotherapy, we know that the tumor will be lysed there will be release of this EVB positive MPC cells into the circulation. And what happened is that during chemotherapy, patients are invariably immunosuppressed. We, we believe that this is a unique opportunity for us to add on natural killer cells, uh, innate cells 
that can be given infused to this group of patients and then mop up the circulating EBV cells and therefore preventing this, these cells from staying dormant in the patients resulting in potential distant relapses in the future. So with that uh, hypothesis and understanding from the mechanism, we look at whether it's feasible to expand uh, NK from healthy donors and certainly we were able to do uh, expansion of about 350 fold after 21 days that is clinically relevant, the numbers. And this is the uh, cancer, NK cell cancer cycle, just to understand the phenotype of the NK cells that we are expanded. Uh, that were able to be used as uh, cytotoxic uh, NK cells against cancers. And when we profile these uh, NK cells after expansion, we can see that they are at particularly enrichment of the CD56 population after uh, at day 21 and certainly uh, remain stable at 70 to 80 percent with subsequent co-cultures. And we found that a large majority or uh, nearly 60 percent of this NK cell that were expanded were of the CD57, CD16 positive uh, phenotype. And when we showed uh, the in vitro killing of this expanded uh, NK cells, we found that they were able to increase, uh, uh, kill this MPC cells in vitro, uh, achieving a near 80% cytotoxic uh, cystity assays at 5 is to 1 ratio. Next, we move on uh, to look at the efficacy of this expanded NK cells uh, in, in vivo. So we, we use a, a treatment strategy where we combine NK cell with cisplatin, and this is how the schema looks like. And certainly we look at the purity of this NK cells, nearly 100% or 99% were well, that of a, a, a 50, CD56 positive, and a large percentage was co-expressing the CD56 molecule, which is one of the uh, marker for maturation of the NK cells. Figure, figure three, uh, C and D certainly shows that this con uh, this escalation or treatment with uh, NK plus cisplatin is certainly very well tolerated among the, the mice treated with this combination therapy. And when we look at figure E, where we look at the uh, effects of the NK cells being integrated, we certainly show that uh, it has an additive uh, results. As you can see, this is the blown up figure that was shown earlier. When, you, uh, when we use NK cells or cisplatin, they achieve fairly comparable tumor suppression uh, individually, but when we add uh, NK plus cisplatin, there was an additive uh, anti-MPC effects seen in this in, in, in vivo study. What was noteworthy is when we separate the tumor uh, growth kinetics or suppression kinetic for the first 11 days and the subsequent uh, 11 days, the first 11 days being tumors that are generally smaller, whereas the next 11 days our tumors are generally larger. And what we found that uh, the effect of combining NK cell with cisplatin was more pronounced among smaller tumors than in larger tumors. And that fits our hypothesis that NK cells is probably more uh, designed to target minimal residual disease, i.e. those with patients with positive circulating EBV DNA in, among MPC patients. So I think this is just how uh, we, we kind of reason out that this is probably a good strategy from, uh, from this sort of experiments. And this is just to demonstrate the rate of growth amongst the mice treated across the different uh, treatment protocols. As you can see, only among tumors that are smaller, we are able to see a more pronounced effect when we combine NK cell with cisplatin. And this is to show uh, the tumor size among the mice that were sacrificed after completing the treatment. And certainly you can see the combination treatment certainly has a, a much uh, uh, smaller tumors after the treatment protocol. So with that understanding, we led on to design a phase one, moving to a phase two study. Uh, this is a, a slide just to demonstrate the statistics of how we want to use a adaptive trial design using the Bay Bayesian uh, inference uh, continuous toxicity monitoring uh, to establish the maximum tolerable dose for allogenic NK cell use in a concurrent setting. And this is a phase one leading to a phase two where we want to integrate uh, NK cells during and as well as an adjuvant during the, the standard of care treatment with concurrent chemo radiotherapy. So we, we envision to give the NK at day 14 after uh, day one is the start of radiation and day 14 we will integrate one dose of NK cells and then next one at day, 40, day 28 and then upon completion at day 25 we will then give weekly NK cells for 
six uh, for four cycles with the additional of four cycle if needed if the patient remain to be positive with circulating EBV uh, DNA titus. So we'll be profiling um, the EBV DNA assays longitudinally during this uh, treatment. At the same time, we'll also be collecting the PBMC so that we can understand the biology when uh, this group of patients are treated with allogenic NK cells uh, in this setting. So we are looking at the kinetics of the decline uh, of EBV DNA and we are also like to understand possible biomarker for responders and particularly we are also uh, having a tissue biopsy at baseline at, at, uh, at the uh, midpoint where we will look at whether NK cells are being uh, infiltrated into the tumor. We are also looking at the phenotyping of NK cells both in the tumor and the circulation and for the tumor, we are particularly interested to look at the ligands of uh, on the MPC tissue to see whether they are upregulated uh, with the stress ligands after concurrent chemo radiotherapy. Right, just, just to illustrate how the uh, heterogene heterogeneity of MPC tissue, this is just to show um, a, a digital slide of an MPC tumor where the, the areas are drawn out. Uh, by our, our pathologist circling the areas of the tumor by the green circles and the areas that are uh, demarcated red is, are the lymphocytes that is infiltrated into the tumor. And now with the advanced in technology, uh, we are able to actually micro dissect this quite in high throughput fashion and we can then look at the individual signatures of, in the tumor as well in the lymphocytes to have a better understanding of the, of the treatment uh, uh, impact following any treatment options for this group of patients. So to summarize, uh, we believe that MPC is an excellent cancer model to incorporate the use of immunotherapy. And there are specific goals from a clinical perspective. Number one, among the refractory uh, MPC patients, certainly we hope to advance the survival in this group of patients beyond repeated palliative chemotherapies. And certainly, we, uh, among the high-risk MPC patients, we certainly hope that by integrating immunotherapy can potentially minimize the relapse in the stage 3 and 4 uh, non-metastatic uh, non MPC patients. Uh, certainly, there are many facets of immunotherapy strategies and our group is uh, keen to integrate the allogenic off-the-shelf natural killer cells into locally advanced MPC and using a very highly uh, sensitive assay of circulating EBV DNA as a surrogate to measure minimum residual disease is ongoing. Uh, yeah, so we would like, like to really thank Actress for partnering us in this uh, clinical trial that is being uh, likely rolled out in the near future. So I'd like to thank uh, our collaborators, both within SGH, uh, Otron Campus, National Cancer Center, as well as NUS, Duke NUS, uh, as well as the um, ASTAR collaborators for all this work that have been presented. All right, I think this is my final slide and uh, happy to reach out to anyone. If you uh, have questions that I've not been able to address today, you are certainly welcome to email me and I will be happy to share with you more information. Uh, certainly, I'll, I look forward to the Singapore uh, Cell and Gene Therapy meeting. I'll be presenting on the similar area but giving you more data coming up from our lab uh, uh, talking about uh, NK cell and cell therapy in MPCs. All right, I think that's all. Thank you very much for coming on, on during lunchtime. Thank you, Prof Lim, for a very elaborate presentation on your work. Uh, we'll now proceed with the Q&A session. All right, if anyone has any questions, please type your question in the Q&A function and we'll take your question accordingly. Um, alternatively, you can click on the raise hand button, unmute yourself and proceed to ask questions. So any questions from anyone? All right, at this point of time, um, I don't see any questions from the audience, so perhaps we will wrap up our session. On behalf of Actress, thank you very much, Prof Lim, for the enlightening presentation. And to all our audience, thank you for attending today's lecture. Have a very good afternoon, everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much.